Hi, I'm Greg, Assistant Provost and Executive Director for Teaching, Learning, plus Technology at Stony Brook University. And this is Innovations in Education. In our show, we feature faculty and staff using innovative approaches and best practices in teaching. And applications of educational technology have had a positive effect on student learning. On this show, I'm joined by Dr. Lori Scarlatis from the Department of Technology and Society in our College of Engineering and Applied Sciences. And we will be discussing group project-based learning. Lori, welcome to the show. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about the courses that you teach? Well, I have both undergraduate and graduate courses. The graduate courses are in the area of educational technology. The undergraduate courses I, uh, are co-listed with computer science, and that's in game design. Okay. And the sizes of these classes are? About 20 to 40 students. Okay. Now, you, my understanding is you use a lot of projects in your classes. Can you explain why, uh, why you think that's better for the students? Well, the projects give the students an opportunity to apply what they're learning. And because if you just lecture at them, sometimes it starts to become very abstract. But I find that if they get to do something, then they're really going to remember that experience. So what proportion of your classes, would, uh, I presume they're doing the projects in the class and not assign them or also assign them outside of class? It's part of their outside assignment. So the way I break up the class is I spend half of my time on theoretical concepts. And so this is the foundational knowledge that a lot of it won't change over the years. Mm -hmm. And this will allow them to continue to learn and look into this area. And then I have a practical area. So they learn how to use certain types of software to apply what they're learning right now. Okay. How do you choose the projects? I come up with a framework, a problem set that allows them to, well, it always has some sort of constraints, but then they can choose what to do within that. So for example, in uh, the design of courseware mm -hmm. class, I teach them lots of different tools they can use to put together some sort of electronic courseware. Um, and then I tell them that they have to create a lesson that could be taught in one day to one week. But then they get to pick the topic and they get to decide what goes in. Well, I tell them some things that have to go in. You need a lecture component. Mm -hmm. You also need an opportunity for the students to practice what they've learned. And you also need something that will get them to think about how to apply this outside the class. Okay. How, how do you create your groups to do these projects? Are they just randomly assigned? Well. So I do it differently in different classes. In the game design course, the idea there is to design a game. And the idea is to have them learn to listen to each other and respect one another's points of view and background. And so I will create a team based on differing interests. So I'll have a computer scientist and a journalist and a digital media minor and mash them all together, mm. and they have to design a game within the constraints I give them. And I do that three times in the semester, every time they get a different team. Okay. So if they're not happy with the first team, then maybe the second team will be better. And for the last one, I let them say who would they would, would like to be on a team with, and who would they not like to be on a team with. And do you assign roles to the team members, or are they all just sort of equal members? They have to come up with that themselves. My hope is that everyone has a voice, mm -hmm. because if you have one person who takes over and dictates to everybody else, then they don't have that ownership. Okay. One of the biggest challenges of using groups is, is always the concern that one person does all the work and everybody gets the credit. How do you overcome that problem? How do you know that everybody has worked equally in the group? Well, I, at the end of the project, so they do the project and they have to present it to the class. Um, and after that, they all have to rate one another. And okay. so I 
love using SurveyMonkey. I create a little survey for them to fill out for their teammates. And then I pass it on to them. So they get to see the comments. They get to see what their teammates think about them. And they may not be happy about it, but I think it helps them to learn to work with one another. So you feel the students are better. fairly honest in providing and that feedback? And I think feedback? they're very honest. And so sometimes I'll have surveys come back and they'll say, who is this person? I don't know who they are. <laughs> <laughs> so they were nice when they were in the group and all of a sudden you have this, this scathing set of comments or something and they, they can't figure out who it came from? Is that what you're saying? Oh, no. No? No, sometimes I put the teams together and someone just doesn't show up to the classes, oh, doesn't really? show okay. up to meetings because they have to meet outside the uh -huh. class. And uh, so that comes out in the comments and it does affect their grade. Now, do they grade each other or do you give them a grade based on the comments? So the grade is based in three different things. Um, I, again, use SurveyMonkey and I have everyone in the class grade the project based on these rubrics that I give them. And then I give a grade also using the same rubrics. And so my grade counts for half of it. Mm. Uh, the classroom, what they think, is that uh, counts for a quarter. And then the last quarter is what their teammates think about them in terms of how well they did. If a faculty member came to you and said, I want to use projects for my class, but I'm really struggling with how to come up with ideas for projects, what type of advice would you give them? Are there resources on the internet or anything that would help with that? I think the best ideas would probably come from the instructor because it really has to be based on the course material. And so if you just think, what would be a practical problem that a student would see when they get out in the world? where they would have to apply this knowledge, and okay. that will be the best. What was the most challenging aspect of implementing group project work in the classroom? The most challenging part is when... Challenging for you. For me, uh -huh. is that sometimes the students don't like the teams I put them in, and they'll get stuck with someone that they argue with, or someone who is not contributing, and that is difficult. Um, and so I'm still not quite sure what to do about that. I'm open to suggestions. But, of course, in the real world, that's, that's what happens anyway. You have to learn to deal with those situations. Right. right. From the student point of view, do you think it's made a big difference in their ability to learn in the classroom or learn in the course in general? Oh, yes, I think so. Because when they're working together, mm -hmm. I see them, they get very animated, they get excited, um, they stay after class and continue to talk about this, and I think that's always a good measure of what, how engaged they are in the classes. Are they talking about it outside the class time? Okay. So stepping back from the focus on group projects, if a new faculty member came to you and said, I'm just beginning to teach, mm -hmm. uh, please give me some advice, the most important two or three points that you could about how to teach effectively, what would that be? Oh, that's a good question. I guess part of it would be to involve the students. That's a, a big part of it. Um, always give them opportunities to apply what they're learning, okay. practice it, um, and give them assignments where they can take ownership and where they can feel that what they're doing is relevant. So essentially make them responsible for their own learning as yes. much as possible. Yes. Okay. So what would you like to do new in the future? Do you have ideas of new things you'd like to implement? Well, I'm working on a project now where I've created a multiplayer game that's built on top of a simulation. And the simulation is supposed to show how climate and world economies change as people make choices about what types of energy to purchase. And so I'm working on curricular materials to go into this. And so I'd like to see how it works to have kids playing a game which applies what they're learning in the classroom. So given that this is, you know, games and so on are a big part of your research and your teaching, do you see a point in time where we won't have classrooms where students will just be totally immersed in simulated learning environments? Oh, no. I think the teacher is essential 
you need the teacher to provide guidance, uh -huh. to say, well, what were you thinking when that happened? Maybe you should look over there. And so, yes, the student has to be involved, but you can't just leave the students to themselves. The teacher is very important. And I also find that the students like to talk to the teachers. They don't want to just sit in their rooms by themselves. They enjoy this engagement. Question for our audience. Um, what do you think might be good sources for group projects? The answer when we return. <laughs> Joining us is Nancy Wozniak, learning architect within the TLT Faculty Center at Stony Brook University. So Nancy, how can faculty get ideas about good group projects for their classes? The very first place to go is your students. And Lori does that well in her classes, in that the students um, are always part of the teaching and learning aspect. She, she has the outcomes, she knows what they want them to learn, but she will solicit ideas from her students. And what that does, I'm taking a course with Lori, all of us feel a part of this learning and teaching process. We're a team, and you learn when you're a team, and we're relaxed. Um, always start a class. You, you know what you want to get out of that group project. Have them help design. I do when I teach. And I tell them, you need this group project, we've got to do this, it's because of feedback. Um, you'll love it, they moan, they don't like group work. But when they're a part of it and when they can design it, it works and everyone starts to contribute because they're part of the project. So Laurie, do you give them any type of instructions or obje learning objectives for the project to, to help them determine what they're supposed to be achieving? Oh, absolutely. There are constraints. So in the class that Nancy is taking, which is educational games, they have to create a game that has to teach something very specific to a particular audience. And so they have to think about um, who is going to be learning this, what are their learning outcomes, and how are they going to okay. be learning it so, from the so game? So you're talking about the learning outcomes of the consumer of the student's project. Yes. What I'm asking is, do you actually give a list of learning objectives to the students in terms of what they're expected to learn from their projects, or to help them design their project? And would that be helpful? Well, I guess it's somewhat recursive, because what I want my students to learn is, my learning objectives is for them to be able to identify and address other people's learning right. objectives. And that, that, that is brought out. Right. And that's where the group comes into it. So she is giving us guidance and, um, and she engages. She is never uh, taken back when we ask a question and hmm. She goes through that process with us and we are engaging as students in groups going through that process. So in a way, uh, we're teachers, but in a way we're learning programming and problem solving. Okay. I'll give you another tip, though, on where to find some good ideas for groups uh, or any type of learning activity for your students is at Merlot, as in the wine. It's www.merlot.org. And it's been a faculty exchange, a faculty community, ever since uh, I've been teaching over 10 years and I've always used Merlot. So you, could, I, could I go to Merlot and sort of search, do a search for project ideas? Yes, or what you might want to do is we would go in and look for uh, educational games or if you teach biology, biology, and you're going to find uh, projects in there that you might not use it word for word for word to use the activity, but it's a springboard. Uh, you can modify, even if it's a, a, a something that uh, a high school teacher has put in there. You can modify it to your audience, and you get fresh ideas. Plus, there's a community going on, and you can find uh, educators. I was just in there looking at educational games, and there's some great dialogue going in there and there's a community going on. 
So it's a place, it's like a watering hole for faculty mm -hmm. and from all over the world. But bottom line, browse through uh, the activities that are up there, and you might even want to put an activity up there. It's, there's no copyright. We use Creative Commons in it, in that we are faculty exchanging knowledge and ideas, helping one another, but it's not for commercial use. Right. So that's Laurie and Nancy, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. If you have any questions for either of our guests, you can visit the TLT website at tlt.swimmingbrook.edu or our Facebook site. Just for search for Innovations in Education. Both of them have blogs where you can post questions and uh, we'll respond and discuss those answers with you. I'm Graham Blinn. I look forward to seeing you on the next exciting episode of Innovations in Education. <laughs>